Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On today's panel, it is my pleasure to act as chairman and moderator. As you can see that I'm not going to spend a great deal of time introducing the panel. My field of expertise is military history. I'm going to um, just say a few words because we don't have very much time. Military history enables us to engage in a dialogue with the strategic thinkers uh, that have been forgotten today and receive very little attention. Without a doubt, many questions are raised from today's point of view, particularly with regard to contemporary conflicts, that uh, the strategic uh, thinkers and uh, strategic operative uh, practitioners uh, could answer hybrid warfare, to use the term that we will address in more detail a little bit later. Um, hybrid warfare did not come about only in the last few decades, uh, but we have seen uh, this phenomenon present for the last several centuries, if not uh, for the last 2,500 years. As I said, I would like to be very brief in my statement. All of you are very aware of uh, the Austrian Field mar Marshal Radetzky, who is said to have been a very good operational leader and a popular father figure for the soldiers, particularly in literature or in film. In his writings, in the 1830s, he demonstrated eminent foresight in strategy and military strategy. Allow me to give you several examples of his foresight. To quote, nothing is more unlikely than an ongoing peace with this power, Russia. It has gained such an important influence on all matters in Europe uh, that its approval or disapproval is generally decisive. Our borders with Russia require no defense. Any hostile army that invades there can only be met by an equal army as the only possible means of defense. That we will be forced to sacrifice Galicia in a war, as we will ourselves be unable to counter the invasions on many sides, which the appearance of its troops on the Danube is meant to prevent. It is then therefore inevitable that Russia will rise to greatness as an arbiter of the four continents that history will be unable to point to any equal or any similar example. Another quote, for the new states currently on the rise in America will subjugate Europe over the course of time. Also quite interesting, the following quote, we are unable to rise to the high ideal of a union of Europe whose urgency is so clearly before our eyes. Europe is as torn by inner strife than ever. And yet another quote, the great British Empire in East India will tear itself away from Great Britain, as will all of the remaining British colonies separate from England. A canal in the Red Sea will open a shorter route to East India. So this was in the 1830s. Allow me to remind you. Also quite forgotten in the history of warfare, but uh, probably known to all of you, uh, General Giulio Dewey and uh, the Air Force officer Amadeo Mekotzi. He was his counterpart. Uh, he was in favor of uh, supporting the uh, of his own army units, and he was against um, any kind of um, air war against the hostile civilian population. Or, of course, there are numerous examples, fake news, uh, black propaganda in the Second World War, and, of course, we had war propaganda in the years prior to that, or fake news, for example. Radio Liberté is a good example of this, operated by the German Reich. And uh, the British uh, broadcaster, Soldaten in the Calais, operated by, as I said, Great Britain from October to 1943 to April uh, 1945, um, engaged in black propaganda in this way. 
was a description of the enemy radio codes uh, from Bletchley Park can be counted uh, here as well. There are innumerable examples of uh, which each one would be worthy of its own presentation and extensive discussion. Military history shows us very well known phenomena of a strategy of political communities and military organizations, which, however, are clearly recognizable taking into account other societal and technological circumstances. But let us allow our speakers to present their views on the subject. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Donald Stoker. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for, for having me here today. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about very briefly, I'm a bit of a contrarian, some of my, my wife says, you know, certainly. Uh, and uh, the, the concept of hybrid war, I have some some issues with it. Uh, one of the weaknesses of, of American strategic studies, uh, I think, is um, there's always just constantly some new buzzword or some new term for defining war that is appearing that isn't, isn't necessarily helpful. Fourth generation warfare, fifth generation warfare, whatever it is, uh, uh, the, whatever it is at the most recent one. And these statements or these terms then eventually find their way into American policy documents, strategy documents, uh, doctrine, and then eventually they uh, infect our friends and allies, you know, as well. Uh, and one of the issues I have with it, we're constantly developing these new terms and supposed new ideas, but they don't seem to have helped the United States win or p win any of its wars lately or to prosecute them any more effectively. And, and I think hybrid war just fits one of the, the recent examples of it. Uh, uh, theory, Clausewitz tells us that theory is supposed to inform the mind of the future commander. It's supposed to clarify concepts. It's supposed to, to, to to make things clear, help our thinking, uh, in, increase our judgment, uh, better our judgment. Do these terms do that? And I think very often they don't. And I, I, I think hybrid war doesn't help us with that very much either. Uh, the, the core text of, of hybrid war for, for Americans uh, is an article by Frank Hoffman in 2007, A Conflict in the 21st Century. And it's unfair, I think, to lay all of the issues and certainly all the writing around hybrid war at Hoffman's feet because there are hundreds and hundreds of articles in just about every language that one could possibly imagine uh, where this term is discussed. But what did, what, did hybrid, what, did, what did Hoffman say that this was? Well, his definition is, hybrid wars incorporate a range of different modes of warfare, including conventional capabilities, irregular tactics and formations, terrorist acts, including indiscriminate violence, coercion, criminal disorder, these multimodal activities can be conducted by separate units or even by the same unit, but are generally operationally and tactically directed and coordinated within the main battle space. Uh, now, that's a, if you look first glance at the definition, it says, you might think, okay, this is something I can work with, but the more you tear it apart, especially if you're trying to redefine war using this uh, as a definition, and, and particularly as a lot of the hybridists do say, this is something new, or this is something we've never seen before. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to do that because when you really look at it and splice it, it simply boils down to a discussion of tactical means with a little bit of crime and a little bit of subversion uh, thrown into the mix. Uh, other places he talks about this, he says, uh, hybrid threats will employ all forms of war and tactics, perhaps simultaneously, as well as criminal activity. Uh, he follows this with another explanation that says hybrid threats incorporate uh, a full, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, hybrid threats incorporate a full range of different modes of warfare. And, and the tactical focus goes on with this. In another 2009 piece, he says, I define a hybrid threat as any adversary that simultaneously and adaptively employs a fused mix of conventional weapons, irregular tactics, terrorism, and criminal behavior uh, in the battle space. This is, again, just simply description of tactical means. So to argue that this is something new, I find a little, little bit difficult uh, to, to take. Uh, second, the hybrid war enthusiasts, when they, when they say they've got this new type of war, uh, they, 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 and they really don't have much of an intellectual foundation to stand on. If you look at what Clausewitz says or Sir Julian Corbett, how do you define a war? You def the wars are defined by the political objective. Wars are fought either for regime change or for something less than this. Then you start examining the strategy, the means, you know, and so on. Uh, the hybridists, they're defining war by the means. The difficulty with doing this is that it, it's a very subjective term. It doesn't really give you a firm foundation to stand on. It doesn't give you a footing for then doing really constructive, you know, critical analysis. Now, it's certainly important to, to study the means and methods, you know, of war, but it's, it's not, the whole, not the whole thing. Uh, also, you know, conceptually, you know, they argue this is something new, 
but they're actually just repeating uh, some of the mistakes made by some of some American writers in the 1950s. Uh, the, there was a writer in uh, 1951, a Navy captain uh, called Harvey Same. You know, he wrote something, he wrote about what he called fringe war. And this is his description of it. He says, uh, fringe war it consists primarily of a series of minor engagements for limited objectives. It is carried out by relatively small forces. It utilizes puppet or satellite groups as a smokescreen to mask the single uh, coordinated communist effort. It is waged in many different uh, manners, both military and non-military. This reads exactly like some of the descriptions that the hybridists write about and some of the gray zone uh, writers when they, when they write about the Ukraine or write about what happened in the Crimea. It's exactly the same type of thing that uh, Same is writing about in the 1950s. And it's again just an explanation of the tactical methods. Now thirdly, uh, the arguments for hybrid war are often uh, really bad history. Uh, Hoffman in his uh, writings on this, he says, uh, he, he looks at the Vietnam War, the Napoleonic Wars, and the American Revolutionary Wars, and he says these conflicts aren't hybrid because they, they don't meet his criteria of mixing uh, unconventional and conventional uh, tactical methods. And this is just completely you know, mistaken, you know, historically. Uh, when you look at the Vietnam War, uh, the mixing of conventional and unconventional, and with a lot of terrorism as well, this is the essence of Vietnamese, of North Vietnamese revolutionary warfare. You mobilize everything. You use everything that you can uh, of the state. Uh, if you look at the Napoleonic Wars, you know, certainly in, after 1812, when the Napoleonic invasion uh, of Russia, militia commonly fought side by side with the Russian army. In 1813, when Prussia breaks uh, from France, uh, Landwehr, Prussian militia, consistently filled out a lot of the corps of the uh, Prussian army up until the end of 1815. American Revolutionary War, the same thing. You know, George Washington consistently used militia and regular forces. Again, this is, they, the hybridists look at the, look at these examples and say, oh, this is something new, what we see in, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine and other places. But no, it really, it really is not. Uh, fourthly, uh, the most recent hybrid outbreak, as, as I call it, uh, it, is based on, a lot of it is based on a misreading of some of the Russian, uh, Russian ideas as well. But particularly important is this February two, 2013 article by uh, the chief of the Russian general staff, uh, General Valery Gerasimov. Uh, and in a lot of, uh, particularly a lot of American writers, what Gerasimov supposedly has done uh, is, is, is or written a new doctrine, and this supposedly underpins what happens in the Ukraine. But there's really no such thing as a Gerasimov doctrine. If you go back and actually read the, the articles about it, what Gerasimov is actually doing is just simply giving his description of what he thinks the future operational environment is going to look like and what he thinks a future war might look like. He's not trying to develop anything new. Uh, interesting, in, in November of 2017, uh, Gerasimov gave a lecture in Moscow where he talked about one of the problems that the Russians had is that the Americans uh, and the other Western uh, companies or uh, countries are waging a hybrid war against the Russians. Now, so to, to conclude then, uh, the, to me, the, the, one of the unfortunate you know, results of uh, the construction of all these new terms is, again, they, they make their way into American policy and strategy documents. And the result of this is that I, I think sometimes the American documents or American policy is being built on, on ideas that are really unsound and, and sometimes just complete, you know, complete myth. Uh, the notion of hybrid war, hybrid threat appears and starts appearing in American policy documents in 2010. By 2015, it's worked its way into the U.S. national military strategy. Uh, the definition here, it talks about a hybrid conflict. It says it blends conventional and irregular forces to create ambiguity, to seize the initiative, to paralyze the adversary. And it may include the use of both traditional military and asymmetric systems. This is, again, a discussion of the tactical means, but the, the, one of the, the, the great pro and it's nothing, nothing new. It's the way uh, war has always, always been waged. But the, the bigger problem I have it is that this is supposed to be the national military strategy. If the national military strategy is built, built upon tactical means, this is a, a, a real problem uh, because there's certainly a big difference between tactics, operations, strategy, grand strategy, policy. And I think there's sometimes uh, uh, this isn't handled very well, isn't thought about very well. Uh, I think um, there's a, a retired Army officer and historian named Antulio Echevarria, and he deals really, I think, decisive blow to a lot of these concepts. He says, is it worth asking whether history can provide examples of wars that were not hybrid, you know, in some way? And you see also in a lot of the discussions 
uh, of, of hybrid war, again, it's largely on means and methods and largely on the tactics and without often a realization that that is what is going on. You know, back to Clausewitz, theory is supposed to inform our mind, give us a better understanding, clarify concepts. And, and I think that uh, uh, too often these terms don't do it. At the conference held here at the Defense Academy in the fall, the, uh, the general who closed out the conference, uh, he said that, uh, uh, I can't remember it exactly, but he said essentially that uh, Austria shouldn't pay too much attention to things that come out of American think tanks. And I, I thought that's the smartest thing I've heard, you know, here at the conference of the last three days. Uh, so, well, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, talk about uh, the Western history of uh, military strategy. I would like to introduce uh, key principles of warfare. This has been maintained through history. I would like to outline a number of strategies uh, uh, in light of the impact. And then at the end, I would like to talk about uh, uh, possible and necessary developments. And the history of a military strategy is dominated by the search for overarching maxims for every kind of warfare. These principles are uh, found as essential characteristics in Clausewitz. Uh, however, with the caveat that recognizing, following, and applying them uh, can only be recognized in a case by case basis. And, uh, must also be considered against the backdrop of uncertainty, coincidence, or friction. For me, the key principles are the principle of interplay out of action on both sides or between political goals and military requirements. The principle of uh, the unity of military actions, even in the case of several theaters of war. In other words, no fragmentation of operations. For example, as was the case in Monte Cassino in the Second World War, the principle of the economy of forces, which includes the endurance, logistics, the organization of space, and the formation of reserves. The principle of uh, surprise and initiative, the principle of uh, pursuit as a prerequisite for the genuine uh, victory. The uh, classic uh, example here is Kinesis, not Waterloo. The principle of uh, one's own or an external focal point or combination point of the battle or the campaign. And finally, the principle of the relation between purpose and its means on the basis of uh, the uh, fine tactfulness of judgment. Overarching, this is the goal of achieving or asserting one's own will and conceiving of war from the point of view of peace. We have to start with the beginning of uh, the term strategy, looking primarily at the military leaders of ancient Athens. Uh, it wasn't until Clausewitz that we saw an overarching uh, approach that can be broken down into individual strategies. And today, we are beginning to um, sew these back together, the development of uh, military strategic thinking has uh, taken place on a number of levels. Here we're looking at political military theories and, uh, that can be uh, subsumed under political examinations of war. Political depictions of uh, this time, uh, uh, textbooks of uh, warfare that can be broken down into uh, general war theory or regulations or codes of war. Those that have uh, had impact beyond the contemporary era, era have been decisive. The origin of war and therefore uh, the strategy can uh, be identified in terms of single combat by Homer or in the Bible. And here we can see this with Clausewitz. Um, we can see that the use of force and uh, combat are fundamental principles of war. Here. We can think about Heraclitus, who thought of the natural opposition of uh, the dictated world order of the cosmos and the immutable being as a dialectical path of logos over polemos towards harmony, the differentiation from friend and foe can be seen all the way up until Karl Schmidt, and of course, this leads us again to Clausewitz. We can see that Schmidt's term of uh, containment of war is very modern. 
give us a new times. Uh, of course, the first panel uh, touches on other issues uh, involving sex, the state in terms of politics and others. One of the most important uh, political military works on strategy is uh, Thucydides. His uh, linear dialogue from the Peloponnesian War is a masterpiece of laying out political military strategy about my big right. Bismarck was interested in this in 1866, and I think that Mr. Trump seems uh, to have read this, although I doubt that very much. Historically, and in this uh, context, uh, we have to uh, cite Machiavelli with his political dimension of war, including the ability to wage war. And interestingly enough, at the time, the rejection of uh, mercenaries and the obligation of all citizens uh, to defend their state, even militarily. And also drawing on Cicero. Uh, Hugo Grotius is an important thinker, particularly with the inclusion of war in worldly law, uh, the Jus ad Bellum and Jus in Bello, and also in his uh, definition of the freedom of the seas, a legal one that, uh, for example, Great Britain never complied with. Historically, militarily, we could begin with Herodotus, Xenophon, or Caesar. What do they have in common? They used uh, personal experience as a justification for their actions. This is uh, something that we have even seen uh, throughout history up until General Schwarzkopf. These are not only part of our educational canon, but were also used as textbooks uh, for military and political action. For example, Xenophon, with his uh, work on horsemanship, created regulations on um, horsemanship and leadership that is used today. There have been other textbooks who are, um, which are indispensable for understanding the military uh, contemporary um, happenings and military strategy for the development. The science of war, the art of war, theory and practice, practical uh, aspects um, blur together. We saw in innovations in leadership, operational, tactical, warfare, military organization, and technology. These were encouraged and promoted. And uh, these were something that later strategists were able to build on. Uh, the leadership of uh, people is very important, particularly in the military areas. It uh, has a very important strategic dimension. For Tinus, with his uh, war strategy, is very important. In particular, uh, he paved the way for Vigais uh, and was read up until Clausewitz, uh, even in the modern area. Also, French authors of the 18th century were very important. All of them drew on experiences uh, from the ancient world. Uh, which were not only important due to their longevity, but also due to their practicality. I would also like to uh, touch on the cardinal virtues that were touched on yesterday. I would also like to mention Emperor uh, Leo VI, who was the first uh, military author who touched on the uh, emphasize the importance of logistics and the responsibility for uh, military leaders, and, uh, as opposed to living off the land. This has prevailed in the warfare and uh, was seen in the Thirty Years' War. War feeds war, and this was uh, described insufficiently there. Uh, Montecuni also touched on uh, what three things are needed to, in order to wage war. Money, money and money again. L'argent, l'argent, and quoi l'argent? Yeah, he can be seen as a logistic uh, strategist. Uh, this uh, approach to logistics is very important because the uh, uh, was very important, particularly for uh, the German army, and uh, particularly in terms of uh, quartermastering. And of course, this is something that uh, came back to haunt me uh, later on. Also, castle. 
from the Dutch uh, Swedish school. Uh, it's an exa excellent example for the creation of a court of war. Uh, particularly with regard to, to uh, modern troop warfare, war uh, leadership. Uh, uh, the architect of uh, uh, famous uh, for his uh, uh, New Island building fortresses, was important for Montembert or Cardinal or Chavez, uh, particularly up to the Maginot Line. The ideas of a scorched earth and the ongoing uh, destruction of the field uh, can be seen here. Here we see the dichotomy of the preeminence of defense or attack. And here we see this against the backdrop of the necessity of preemptive form. Uh, the question whether or not war begins with defense after an attack still remains heated. Frederick the Great, with his uh, secret instructions for his generals, with uh, Fortune and Kudai. Um, also, I drew on Count uh, Jean Bartlippe um, as the teacher of Schranhaus, particularly as uh, the inspector of the Portuguese army, the colonels. He uh, focused on uh, the defensive war uh, due to particularly the geopolitical situation in, of uh, Portugal. Giesenhau touched on this in his decisive victory over Napoleon. This is particularly important against the background of uh, today's events. Uh, Count Wilhelm is also an excellent example uh, for the European influence overseas. See Steuben's Blue Book in uh, the USA of the time. This uh, focus on the intellectual commonality, particularly as a military intellectual culture in Europe, and I think this is something we desperately need to return to. Georg Heinrich von Bernhorst is somebody we need to mention here. And looking back to the French Revolution, talked about the, the People's War. Heinrich von Bulow was a predecessor of Germany. Und was eine Punkt des Bernhorst in Kausewitz. Even though he pointed out these guidelines, namely that any commander of the army should serve as a compass. The idea of rules or helpful uh, regulations are particular particularly reflected in the American idea of a manual, and unfortunately, this uh, can be found in uh, the current approach uh, to troop leadership in the German army. Archduke Charles, as uh, the victor of Asgard in 1809, should be mentioned here as well. His fundamentals of strategy and touch on the possibilities of active defense of the mountainous areas and the decisive uh, point of numerical superiority in the right place. The economy of forces and the limitation of the goal to prevent escalation are the focus of his views. So this is a very modern approach. Allow me to touch on Kausewitz once again. Of course, uh, this would be worthy of a presentation lasting the entire semester. But I would like to touch on Mark as well national strategy as a system of uh, temporary measures, uh, so rejection of any kind of methodology, the implementation of experience and observation in uh, uh, judgments on the basis of ethics and the character of the, uh, leadership um, are very uh, applicable even today. This includes uh, uh, moving away from uh, the planability operation beyond an initial meeting and the strategic meaning of a parade, particularly the use of modern uh, uh, technology or the freedom of execution in subordinate areas. With his estimation of the role of a policy in war, uh, he paved the way for the reversal of presidents. One uh, um, thinker in particular is Johann von Bloch, the uh, Polish-Russian industrialist who intellectually anticipated the development of the modern war from uh, the point of view of uh, peace theory. Oh, then there is the French Marshal Fox with the idea of absolute one, Eric Ludendorff with his book on total war. 
Uh, our standard juxtaposition to him. He, it wasn't until General Ludwig Beck that uh, we came back to the preeminence of uh, politics with his idea of containment of form. Allow me to touch on that two particular issues that are very relevant, particularly today. We saw, we have seen an evolution in the image of the soldier from the free warrior to a uh, mercenary or even a um, constricted civilian. Or the question of the preeminence of offense or defense or uh, the prevention of a decisive battle. Of course, we have to touch on Sun Tzu in conclusion. He appeared in French translation in 1772 in Beijing, but he has only become widespread um, in the Western world since the beginning of the 20th century. However, it is uh, doubtful whether Klaus Witz, or Jomini, or others are new of him. But he does represent a very special feature because uh, he postulated uh, victory without war, which means that he uh, talked about imposing his will on the opponent without a fight. The meaning of a spy or the importance of spies and intelligence or even fake intelligence were important. Here we're talking about intelligence, not just information. This is something the Cossacks was very skeptical about, uh, this kind of approach. Irrespective of Mao can be applied uh, to Chinese uh, policy and um, economic understanding even today. Uh, dependent of this uh, view, can find uh, new ideas, particularly against the backdrop of indirect war, particularly with Bofra. The idea of a war where intent, methodology, and even the trigger are known, but not the actual opponent or originator can be identified. The challenges for strategy, national and international law, such as international law, security measures, warfare, and ethics are obvious and require an urgent solution. The intellectual benefit from the, uh, looking at history of uh, the evolution of strategy are as follows. Uh, the four criteria, anticiper, imaginer, concevoir, this means anticipating, imagining, conceiving, and innovating. Possibly, we need here, in order to go back to Homer, a kind of Odyssean curiosity. This is a criteria that the uh, majority of the strategic thinkers and uh, authors have tried to fulfill with uh, more or less success. Uh, this should be an encouragement for us. As uh, Raymond Aron uh, encouraged us, or Gerard von Sandrat uh, called for, the lieutenant, and not only he, must imagine war, uh, primarily future war. Against this backdrop, uh, I hope that my uh, presentation can serve uh, to understand uh, this as a panorama of the past, present, and uh, future perspectives. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm just trying to be a little bit funny just to make sure that you understand that I'm not like them. Because if you think of me like them, my presentation will be ridiculous, okay? Um, so I'm a pedagogical philosopher that came out of sports sciences. So I deal with training, performance, and culture. I deal with how do we, what is performance culture? So how do we develop a soldier into the, for, for the future? So my doctoral thesis was actually entitled On Developing Postmodern Soldiers. Not in the sense that of this French kind of postmodernism of, of, of abstractness, but in the sense that what comes after the modern. So that's sort of where I am, just so you, so you know before, before we go ahead, okay? Okay, so, if it, so my, I entitled my speech today, Developing Strategic Thinkers. A puzzle solver, as puzzle solvers, or mystery analysts, okay. If you, if you think about um, the times that we are living in, they are changing. 
and they have always been changing. So that's not, nothing new. Even though the three examples that I have put up on the board, the Brexit, the Ukrainian divide, and even the, the Kim-Trump summit just a couple of weeks ago. We didn't, we didn't foresee that if you go some, some years, some months and years back. They came suddenly. But how, how ab abrupt are these changes? I think that's what, what Donald was talking about in some senses. Do we meet them with something completely new? Or do we meet them with what we know from before? And or are they just, just elaborations on what we have done before, uh, alterations? Or are they something completely new? That's sort of the questions that I try to deal with. So, um, Gregory Treverton, he, in 2007, he came up with this puzzle solvers or mystery analysts. And he talks about puzzle solvers as, as, a, as something, if you think about it, if you, if you put out a jigsaw, the answer is already there. Our job is to find each piece of that jigsaw and put it in the correct place. And if we do that, we have a nice picture. Probably something from Austria, you know? It's a lot of Ravensburg jigsaws out there. And they're really nice, you know? And you can even have them on your wall afterwards. But the interesting part about that is that the jigsaw puzzle, the answer is there already. So we just have to find each piece to the puzzle to put it in there. And if you think about strategy, people use that kind of metaphor. And, and the, the picture I took up was, just to show you how, how that is, because even the, even the pieces are made in beforehand before we put in the text. But there's a different kind of way of understanding this kind of, of, the, of the future, and that is thinking about it as a mystery. Treverton says that a mystery have no clear articulated query or answer. We don't know what to ask, because we actually don't know what to look for but we know there's something out there that we don't see. And we want to understand that. And he says that, hence, there can, cannot be no decisive answer. There are, diff there are multiple answers to something that we haven't acquired for. So as a philosopher, I'm not that much into the answering business. I'm more into the questioning business. I'm not saying that in the sense that I don't believe in answers. I really do. And I really want to find answers. But I think the way to the answers are by, are by um, proposing better questions. So, Treverton said that mysteries can only be framed by identifying the critical factors and applying some sense of how they have interacted in the past and might interact in the future. That's, what, that's the information that we have. So, Treverton actually said that um, puzzle solving is you, don't, you, you, have the, you have the information you need, so, so it's a little bit lit, too little, so you have to find the information to actually find out how to do it. So for instance, you need to understand what picture you're building to find the right pieces. Mystery, on the other hand, is too much information, so you have to take away some, kind of, some of the information to try and find a way through the model the ground. Okay. So, uh, one way of looking at this is that I've been dealing a little bit about with game changers. So, so what are the game changers? I think that Donald's talk was that when you come up with hybrid warfare and stuff, they want to be the game changers. They want to, to predict something different, but they, they probably not, they don't. So if you think about the left side here, it's a debate about evolution or revolution in, in the sense of change. So if you think about evolution, you're still within the same framework but we add something to what's already there. It's like, it's, it's like some kind of maturity. You mature over time. So we're within, so in an evolution perspective, we we're still within the same paradigm. And it's a little bit like when Giddens talk about the postmodern, when he talks about high modernity and stuff, he says that it's a part of the same modern, but it's, it's a, it's a um, radical way of the modern. On the other side, you have revolutions. And revolutions, the point about them is that they break with the paradigm. They have a different framework. 
And if you look at the right side of the, of the board, it's, it's Kuhn's way of thinking of, um, of scientific revolutions. And Kuhn's point here is that in, norm, in the normal situation, we have normal science. That's the way we go about doing our everyday business. It's a little bit like making a puzzle. We, we sort of have an un understanding of what that we are trying to, trying to frame, trying to, trying to make a picture of. And we're looking for the missing pieces to put into that puzzle. But then he says, there comes a time where we see that the puzzle that we are putting together doesn't actually fit with the reality. There's something here that this puzzle actually don't tell us. So we need a different kind of framework. And there's a crisis within that, within the situation. There's a crisis to normal sciences, and we need a different framework to, to solve it. And then there comes a struggle. Different, different actors come in with different solutions, different types of frameworks. And there's a struggle between them to try and find out what is the best framework for us now to talk about the future. And sometimes people come up with hybrid warfare. You know, somebody come up with maneuver warfare. They come up with attritional warfare and whatever, whatever it is. And there's a struggle. And I think that the, one of Donald's point here was that, well, if it's not any substance within that kind of debate, if you don't actually understand what the elements, the fundaments of that debate is, then you actually are trying to, to uh, make a better picture of the picture you're already making. You're just trying to change that instead of actually starting all over. Uh, how am I on time? About 10 to 15 minutes. No, I, 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 yes, but I, have I used eight minutes or something? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, just, just to know <laughs> where I'm at. Uh, so my point here is that if you want to if you want to frame new, new concepts, you really should take the time to, to understand what kind of concept you're framing. Is this an alteration using the same kind of bricks that you've always used? Is it just reorganizing them? Or is it something different that you actually have to start telling people about what these new types of bricks are? Are you adding some new bricks? So if you, if you look at the, the rabbit, do you see the rabbit? Or did you see the duck? Yeah. So, so, so Kuhn actually said that the paradigm shift is a gestalt shift. So you go from seeing a rabbit to seeing a duck. Actually, you see something different. You see something new. And when we talk about the, about the, about the, 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 the hybrid warfare and, and stuff, is that actually what we're doing? Is there a gestalt shift in it, or is it just something we're altering from, from what before? Okay, so what I've done is that uh, I re, I re, um, when I do my research on pedagogical philosophy, I talk about how do we develop soldiers for the future. So what, one of the, the, the things that I argue is that there are some, there are some way of thinking about, take, thinking about the future. I, I wrote a paper uh, called the uh, Military Education Reconsidered. So I've, t I've seen in, looked into military education. We should expect that for, for a soldier to ha tackle the unforeseen is something that is valuable. So we should expect that military education centers around that in some sense. But if you look into military education, it's the opposite. Because military education is, re is really founded in a kind of modern uh, uh, hierarchical, bureaucratical, rationalistic way of thinking. So soldiers come in and they're given lectures and they're taught how to act because we want them to be the same. And we want to be sure that they will perform in the same manner when they go out in the field. And that's, that is rational and, it's, and it is sound. But at the same time, if the object of your operations changes, you need to have a different kind of perspective on what you're doing. So you need to be trained also in tackling that you haven't been prepared for tackling. And that's where I, I, I in this paper, I talk about six pedagogical strategies. It's probably, using the word strategy is probably very problematic in this conference, but it's still <coughs> pedagogical strategies in this paper. And it's emancipation, deconstruction, vocabulary, dialogue, plurality, and aesthetics. 
I'm just going to show you one of them. So I'm going to use deconstruction just, just a short one. It takes one minute. So deconstruction is about the ability to take apart a concept. To take, apart, take it apart to really understand each fundament of what's hidden in it. So if you, have a if you teach students, you should let them go, go into hybrid warfare and, and not tell them what hybrid warfare is, but do it the other way around. Getting them in there and trying to dismantle what hybrid warfare is and come up with what are the basic principles within hybrid warfare. Challenging them to look behind doing, doing abductive re reasoning, not only deductive or inductive reasoning. When you do that, for instance, I have a class when I do philosophy of science with our master students in Oslo. We see the movie Serial Dark 30 as a part of philosophy of science. Some of you have seen the movie and know there's a lot of sort of science in it. How do we reason? Oops. If you, if you don't, if you only see the movie and take that for the truth, where did the movie come from? Who, who produced it? What were, the, what were the ideas of the producers? What did they want to tell you? Where do they find their, their, their um, information? Well, there's a lot of, lot of books written about the, about the story. And the movie is not about the, the two hours operation of catching Bin Laden. It's about the ten, 10 years of catching Bin Laden. There's a lot of stuff in there that, that you can go down to. So the students have to find the information themselves and they have to entangle it. What kind of information is this? One example, one example of that is, any of you read David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell? Some of you have? No. Donald, you, have you, you read it? Oh no. Okay, I thought you have, because you're a historian. And he starts with the story of David and Goliath. And with our conception of David and Goliath is that Goliath is the giant. And David is the small person facing the giant. So he is the little person. But is this true? Is this the true conception of this story? So if you go, if you, so, so Malcolm Gladwell, he's a, he's a revisionist sort of historian. He's not a historian and he's not a revisionist, but he's a, he's a New Yorker uh, magazine columnist. But he goes back in history and he looks at it. Okay, so when we talk about military, we don't only have infantry. Goliath is an infantryist. So how do you fight an infantry? Do you go head to head with them? No, you use artillery. You know? And you have distance. So David is an artillerist. He's a sling thrower. So sling thrower and arch, ar archers, they were the artillery of the time. And, the sling, and they go back and they try to find out how accurate are the sling throwers. And they're really accurate. You know, and if you look into the story, it's, it, he, he's also um, it's a podcast on revisionist history, and there's a nice 15-minute YouTube story about it. You, you should lo look into that. But it, 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 it turns the history around, telling us that actually David is the superior superior in the story, and that's really important for us to understand when we try to understand concepts. What are the concepts? We use them loosely. Just like uh, you were saying, Donald, on, on this hybrid warfare. We just think about them as new because we haven't, we haven't actually gone into depth in what they are. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it there before I do too much. Okay. So, we've heard a large number of very interesting ideas. Thank you very much for those. And some of them presentations were very humorous. This was a an excellent presentation, really. And I, I thought uh, I heard you smile from time to time as well like during your presentation. So we heard a great deal from Professor Stoker, and we have a few minutes of time left in the session. I think this uh, shows the bridge between the two of them the movie, for example, what kind of message do we have? Have you seen the movie The Patriot? How many of you have seen that with Mel Gibson? 
in the American Revolutionary War, of course, very over-exaggerated, but uh, there are kernels of truth in the movie. There were 30,000 regular British troops supported by loyalist troops as well, and they fought for seven years, and they were involved, as I said, in the war for seven years. And they were fighting against the regular troops. Who were also trainers, etc. But the main portion of the movie uh, focused on the guerrilla warfare in South Carolina. Thomas Sumter, for example, and Francis Marion, uh, famously known as the Swamp Fox. Here, they carried out small time warfare and uh, caused a raft of problems for the British troops. I know that uh, you can't uh, uh, compare this one on one, but you can compare that uh, to a Vietnam, a Vietnam War. You had uh, regular troops as well as uh, guerrilla troops in the Vietnam or the Viet Cong, for example. So you can see that uh, these wars uh, took on various forms. And uh, you can tell uh, that I'm a military historian in 808 to 213 in Spain. You had the regular British troops under Wellesley, 1812. Uh, he was the Duke of Wellington. They were supported by Portuguese and uh, uh, rather small Spanish uh, troop units, and uh, they confronted the Spanish guerrilla movement between 1808 to 1813. There were about 30 to 40,000 Spanish guerrilla fighters in various formations with uh, smooth transitions to robber bands. Uh, so before the war, they were uh, raiders, and then uh, they became freedom fighters, magically, if you will. The French I used a quarter of a million uh, troops uh, for that war, 1808-1813, and they, they lost about 300,000 uh, troops uh, in the war or to disease. Uh, this was not a classic Napoleonic campaign where the campaign was uh, decided in six wars on uh, the basis of uh, three to four battles. This was a war of attrition. And of course, they had uh, fewer forces in other places, in other theaters, for example, in uh, Russia, where they had terrible laws. Koya, for example, de, de la Stresta de la Guerra. There's a very famous uh, painting in Madrid. Of course, you had the shootings, uh, the assassination of uh, the uh, protesters there, of the rebels there. This is something that is certainly not new. This is not a new innovation. We can go back to the 17th century even. The uh, War of the Commissaire in French, uh, 1793 to 1795, the Mondi, uh, guerrilla warfare there. Brutal countermeasures were taken. This is, of course, something that is not new. It was my pleasure to uh, head up both panels together with Dr. Ertl. And I think this can certainly lead to very interesting discussions.